I just... <laughs> Sorry, I'm still laughing at this, uh, the Oval Office tweet about the Miami building collapse. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we are heartbroken over the tragedy in Surfside, Florida. So many humans perished. Some of the survivors' pets are trapped in the rubble, too. These are Mia, Daisy, and Coco. Not pictured bigs. Same condo as Daisy. Another cat, Hippo, and a chameleon named Grimlock. Um... <laughs> It's just oh the, uh, the humanity, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like the Hindenburg happening and being like, oh, I did a sad. This is a, like I think we're gonna find out like some dark truth with this account. This is like this is like a veteran who did like a Bob Carey type thing. He's just got a bunch of tiny little skeletons in his closet, and it's like he's like he was nonverbal after remembering it. And he like he they gave him a service dog, and that's how he like got into this. He got into like we rate dogs and shit, and it's the only way he can communicate. Otherwise, he's just totally like mute. I think these uh these these sort of uh, accounts that um uh sort of uh, communicate the supposed thoughts of pets about their humans. It's like it's filling the gap that Johnny Sun has left in in the yeah. discourse. Is it Johnny Sun like still? Is he he's still, like is he still around. No, yeah, no he's he like, stopped talking like that, I thought. Oh, well, he oh. stopped talking like that, but he's like, Johnny Sun's like the Jay-Z of Twitter. He's like a <laughs> Yeah, franchise. he sucks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he stinks. Uh, like, he's, he's been Johnny shit for 15 Sun, years. He's like, no, he like, he made it. I don't know who the Beyonce of Twitter is, but like, that's whoever he's dating. He like, he's the king he like he got all those books made. He's like a writer. He was a writer on like Bojack and shit. He like that is the grand prize. All those guys who got like a hundred retweets in 2012 for posting like you know my therapist is a dog and skateboards, haha. Uh, they like they were trying to be Johnny's son. They were like the Jermaine Dupri to his Jay Z. Money, like, money ain't a thing. You yeah, Mun Mun B ain't a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't like impeach his success. He's a win- yeah. He won. He won the game. Yeah, he's shitting on everyone. Johnny Sun's like caked up. <laughs> he is. Now I'm yeah. imagining for our earlier conversation, just when we got on. Now I'm imagining a uh, weird Al Yankovic like getting him shot, like putting yeah. his shooters out, putting a couple stacks on him, getting his fucking SUV shot up. I really don't care. In fact, I wish him well, cause I'll be laughing my head off when he's burning in hell. I guess like Johnny Sun, cause he's more of an up and comer, is like King Vaughn or someone. Well, and yeah. Weird Al is the real. We were laughing about before we started recording. We were like talking about like if Weird Al parodied like a little Dirk song, and he's like, "What? Why are people mad at me? <laughs> Why is everyone yelling at me?" Um. All right. So let's um let's let's, let's do a little calisthenics. Let's do a little warm up. Um. Come. Uh, this one comes courtesy of sort of uh, uh, engagement farmer and music journalist Eric Alper. I don't uh, think you should call him an engagement. Like, what about him is engaged? These are just legitimate <laughs> questions he asks for people. Okay. He What's wants like, to know. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he wants to know. He has a thirst for knowledge. Yeah, have you ever woken up, like, in the middle of the night and been like, What's one album cover that's way different than the music inside the album? <laughs> <laughs> like, I wonder, those are the questions we've wondered since the dawn of man. Uh, well, I feel like could, could you fill in the audience in case they're unfamiliar with Eric Alper? Could, could you could you describe him just a little bit more? I mean, like re, his main thing is asking um, asking questions. In 1968, a perfect child was born in Canada. Three years later, he had a horrifying brain injury that would <laughs> cause him to have many questions about the world. Some would say <laughs> this brain injury even represents like a new stage in human evolution that he's sort of sidestepped, advanced past leapfrogged, past 500 years of human mind development to be the ultimate man and ask the true questions that we we didn't even have the words to describe yet. He is a serious XM radio host, which is the most respected job in Canada, and he will get on every day and ask these questions, Will you will stay awake for the rest of your lives thinking about this. He'll get on, he'll say, what's one song where you're always excited to hear the beginning of it? You know, what's 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 one movie that you always watch when it rains? What's wh- who who is an artist that you think would be weird to meet? Like, and people f- people like really like all the 47 year old like Manitobans on Twitter are just like, this is fucking sick. Eric, you're the man. I love well, you, Eric. I mean, sort of the, the genius of his questions is how 
open ended they are. I mean, like, there's not really a specific. It's like, what's your favorite rock song with guitar in it? You know, it's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. it's it, it, it's stuff like that. It could it could really be like almost anything you could reply to. But like, I'm just you gonna could, get just like a, yeah, you could you could reply to reply to any of Eric Elfer's questions with music, and you'd be right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's like I'm it's just gonna so give you a little fucking broad. A, a little, a little survey of some of some of the stuff he posts. That's that's not questions, and then let's get into the questions. Uh, it'll just be um, uh, a photo of Ringo Starr, and then he'll just tweet, <laughs> "Peace and love, Ringo Starr." That's um, a good message. And that's then, a uh, good message. People should the, see that. A photo of Johnny Cash, still Johnny Cash, still timeless. <laughs> <laughs> like, the idea of someone stop no is no longer timeless. <laughs> Like this guy was timeless for about ten years, <laughs> and he stopped. Uh, uh, and then, and then he just sort of like uh, like industry news. Like, uh, for instance, uh, BTS has become the first act in music history to have ten different songs reach number one on iTunes in at least a hundred countries. So, just uh, filling you in on some uh, some exciting news in the record industry. And then, and then they also have like some this. amazing dipping sauces, apparently. If you go oh, to McDonald's. right. Um, and then, and then there's something like this. It'll be a a photo of Gordon Lightfoot, and then he'll just uh, uh, caption 50% Chris Pratt plus 50% Brian Cranston equals 100% Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> Facts. Facts. No. Have you ever, like, noticed, yeah. have you ever noticed how uh, sort of like a soft rocker Gordon Lightfoot looks like sort of like Chris Pratt and Brian Cranston? Well, Eric Alpers got you covered. Well, that's like he's, I, I really see his method. You know, I feel like a code breaker when I look at Eric Elper's stuff because he's like he starts the day. He's got two very broad ones like, you know, oh, can't go wrong with Led Zeppelin. Like uh, Pink Floyd, they get really trippy, you know, like a picture of those guys. And then before he starts asking the questions, he like it's an original. Those other two aren't originals. The next one is an Eric Elper original where it's like, here's something I only I have noticed. And then once you're fully warmed up, kind of like us, it's like, okay, time for questions. Well, uh, this, then there's just um, some like general statements like uh, not being okay is perfectly okay. And you never hear elevator music in elevators anymore. And, you know, he's, he's right, right on both That's, counts once again. I got to say, I, I disagree with the first one because uh, not being okay by definition isn't okay. <laughs> if yeah, it was okay, I, it would be okay. I the fact that it's not yeah. okay means literally means that it's not okay that's the one thing it isn't is okay i also i want to point out to anyone hearing this who gets confused and maybe they don't feel okay if you feel bad it is your fault <laughs> absolutely and you should you should just stop it's a choice <laughs> depression is a choice mental illness is a choice that's what we're trying to say that's what Eric Alpert's trying to say too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay to not be okay because you chose to do that yeah exactly he agrees with me all right, let's let's get into some Eric Alper questions. Okay, uh, first one: uh, What is one unwritten rule you think everyone should know and follow? Again, these very like, very like open ended questions. Yeah, yeah. You guys go first. Okay, uh, an unwritten rule that I wish people would follow is when you give uh, up your seat on the subway to a uh, a mother with children. I don't think the mother should give the seat to the child because, you know, they're, they're okay standing longer than people are. I was giving the seat to you because you looked, you know, uh, like you could use, uh, use a rest. Um, but giving it to a child is um, just like that's cheating. Yeah, the, the kid doesn't need to fucking sit down. The kid is just bursting with energy. The kid can fucking stand up. Their muscles are limber and their bones are, 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 are new. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Matt, what do you have? Uh, men should never be allowed to wear sandals in public. Facts. Okay. <laughs> Says the croc, I, Mr. Croc over here. Crocs First are closed. All, crocs are closed. <laughs> the back is open, though. That's a slip on. And the top is the, it's the front. It's got, like, got it's holes a, in it. You can still see your toes poking out of those things, Matt. First of all, I use. First of all, I don't wear them that often. Secondly, I usually have socks on. So okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm trying to get into Eric's mindset of like very general stuff. And I think I've got one that like most people in their own experience would agree with. When you're putting on an inflatable PVC suit to get farted in and blown up like a balloon, 
the woman who's farting shouldn't look at her phone while she's doing it. Absolutely. I don't care if your mom's Thank calling. You. Like, yeah, I'm paying you to fart in this suit. I'm paying to get blown <laughs> up like a big stinky <laughs> balloon. It's like when we do the, we've all noticed it. The girl looks at her phone. We've all noticed it, right? Or guy, I'm not here to judge. But when we do the PVC fart thing, it's always it's always been like that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, sorry, I didn't know I was boring you. Oh, what, you got something better to do than fill up my fart balloon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Suffocate me <laughs> with your gas. Okay. By the way, they're not even big enough to stomp on me anymore. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, next question. Uh, this is this going. This going back to like his his real uh, wheelhouse, which is of course music. Uh, what's a great song that mentions do or don't in the title? <laughs> 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 it's like hard to come up with an answer because oh it's too fucking. it's too broad. I mean, like uh, the the first one that came to mind was "Do the Bartman" for me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of uh, "Don't Stop Believing." Yeah, don't. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. Mac, do you or don't? <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> Can you come up with a do or do don't or song? don't? Uh, I, it's you harder know than what? you think. That, that song from that thing you do is actually very catchy. That's that thing you do. There we go. All right, another question. <laughs> fucking Merck. I'm just tearing him. through these. Um, okay. All right, well... Uh, do or don't? <laughs> what a shitty fucking question. <laughs> can, you, can, can you think of a song with a verb in the title? Yeah. Oh, I love him. It's like, no, it, 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 honestly, it's hard to come up with an answer for this because it's like, it's like there's too many. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. you say, like, oh, wh what's a song with uh, Paris in the title? Like you would have like a, a smaller list to, to to call from. Yeah. Um. All right. So uh, next question. It's obviously coming off uh, the big holiday weekend. Uh, it's the Fourth of July. So who is the greatest American band of all time? I mean, again, just very very broad question. A lot of lot of lot of variety. A lot, a lot of things you can pull from here. The greatest American band of all time. Uh, for me, it's got to be the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Sepultura. Uh, the Guess Who. <laughs> the, guess, the Guess Who is like, man, I would have loved to have followed the Guess Who on tour. That was probably for like the fail hippies, right? Yeah. Like you weren't cool enough to, you were like, you kind of wore like a big uh, rope necklace with a like ceramic medallion on it that went down to your belly button. You were like unsure of yourself and it's like, um, I'm not like I, I can't do the dead. I'm not cool enough. I have to do the guess who. Uh, because I haven't acknowledged it yet. I do. I'm what I, I said the guess who because I'm I'm wondering how many people are listening to this with a giant vein throbbing in their forehead, yelling, "They're from Canada!" <laughs> I know that. I know they're from Canada. That was the bit. I know Sepultura is from the nation of Latin America. I know that too. Um, Rolling Stones, though, all American, founded in Manhattan, New York City, also the birthplace of hip hop. That's correct. Um, uh, next question. What's a song that mentions a particular brand or product? I mean, like, this was like... <laughs> Yo, that's like, not real. That's not real. You didn't know. Yo, I'm, no, I'm not making this up. What's a song that mentions a particular brand or product? And, like, I don't even know... I, like, I don't even know an answer to this because my answer is every rap song ever written. Yeah. What a fuck... What did he just was he like hung over when he did this one even for eric this one's like so fucking broad i, just, I can't even come up with an i can't even come up with an answer uh casey talk by nba young boy <laughs> what's the what's he, the brand <laughs> like uh, he talks about uh having a wraith oh, okay so like i said every yeah. rap song qualifies yeah, for this yeah Every rap song mentions uh, a luxury automobile, um, designer clothing label, um, an alcohol, or a certain uh, certain brand of a uh, drug. I mean, some quote tweets are so, like, we've all seen the tweet deckers, right? Where it's like, there's a question like this that's like clearly geared up to a specific answer that's going to get really 80,000 retweets so someone can be like, here, buy these like Air AirPods that give you cancer. But like... This is it's impossible to do like a funny answer to this one. That's what's so yeah. genius about That's like it's brilliant. so fucking broad. Man, it's like this one is like it's even for Eric. It's blowing my mind how fucking broad this is. And, and it's this good is, because, as you said, you can't really goof on it, so you have to engage with it earnestly. Yeah, you, no, you, you're right. It's impossible to get like it's too. You can't narrow anything down enough to get a joke. Like there's no. It's just a broad ocean, and you're trying to stick a flag in it. I think you this can't. is. 
I think this is kind of Alper's brilliance is that like he, he does these quote RT things that make it impossible for the quote RT to get more juice than the original tweet. Because like you, no, you, yeah. you can't get any shots off on him because it's just like, here, listen to the, how about this question? What's a great song that mentions running? You know, like you, 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 you were never going to do numbers off of fucking replying to that. And like to that end, you know, like quote tweeting, we all do it, but it's probably like one of the worst things that could have happened to Twitter. And despite him being the most quote tweeted man in history, no one ever gets one over on him ever. <laughs> All right. Well, here, here's the here's the last one, and then let's start the show. This is this is this is the best one in my opinion. This is the most open ended question imaginable. Okay. okay, here we go. Which song never gets old? <laughs> it's just it's just asking you to think <laughs> of a song. That's just like you think of a song in your head, and then just what's remember, a, yeah. What's a song? What, what's a song that you like? Is literally like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, why not just ask people what their favorite color is? <laughs> this is awesome. I like, he's a genius. He's a genius. He should get like candidates' version of the MacArthur grant. He should run against Trudeau, the Trudeau bungler who ruined their response to coronavirus. I feel like if Eric Alper was prime minister, there'd be no blackface scandals because he's just been doing this for his entire life. He never even had the opportunity to dress up like another race. And, like, he would have kept people at home by, like, there would be, like, an Amber Alert thing on your phone. It, like, buzzes horribly and you pick it up and it's like, what's a, what's something, what's a song that tells you to do something? <laughs> and he's, I'm just saying, you stay home all day thinking of it. Eric Alper is Canadian PM. You know, he's, like, changes his account, like, a little bit, you know, like, sort of, just sort of changes the thrust of the questions and he'll be like, uh, what's, a, what's a Catholic school that didn't do genocide in the 20th yeah. century? <laughs> They need change there. Like they're, they're fucked up. They need Eric Alper. I I like. He got mad at Alex at Low and Austin. Um, I, oh, I don't know how. Oh, that surprises but, me. <laughs> yeah, I can't you believe usually Lo Alex and Austin never, angered someone. He's, he's such a nice guy. Alex did a podcast episode about him, and Alper was like, "Thanks for doing a podcast about me." Then he listened to it and was like, "Wow, a lot of lies and assumptions." That's all I'll say. And then blocked him. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i'm not trying to do any lies or assumptions about eric i think he's just like a curious man well yeah no i like i said i'm just i'm, I'm trying to consider his questions and to that end uh I, here's here's one last question uh what's a podcast that has um uh the, the mcdart today's episode with this poll from uh the new york times uh this is headline in video exxon lobbyist describes efforts to undercut climate action on the tape, made in a Greenpeace thing, he described working with shadow groups to fight climate science and detailed efforts to weaken President Biden's proposals to burn less oil. Uh, I'm bringing up uh, th uh, this story to start with because um, obviously I think it's an important story, but I think it, like, it's going to provide um, some context for like the, the next thing I'm going to read. So, um, all right, just, just the, the piece begins. The veteran oil industry lobbyist was told he was meeting with a recruiter, but the video call, which was secretly recorded, was part of an elaborate sting operation by an individual working for the environmental group Greenpeace UK. During the call, Keith McCoy, a senior director of federal relations for ExxonMobil, described how the oil and gas giant targeted a number of U.S. Uh, influential United States senators in an effort to weaken climate action in President Biden's flagship infrastructure plan. That plan now contains few of the ambitious ideas initially proposed by Mr. Biden to cut the burning of fossil fuels, the main driver of climate change. Mr. McCoy also said on the recording that Exxon's support for a tax on carbon dioxide was a great talking point for the oil company, but that he believes the tax will never happen. He also said that the company has in the past aggressively fought climate science through, quote, shadow groups. So, like, nothing, nothing new here that, you know, I would assume this stuff goes on all the time, but it's interesting to have it, you know, confirmed in the paper of record. Um, just continuing, it says... We're playing defense because this is the, uh, the lobbyist talking. <laughs> We're playing defense because President Biden is talking about this big infrastructure package and he's going to pay for it by increasing corporate taxes, Mr. McCoy said in the video call. But if the plan stuck to roads and bridges, the budget would be reduced greatly and limit the need for tax increases, a move that would save Exxon close to a billion dollars. 
The Exxon lobbyists also expressed skepticism <clears throat> over the idea of taxing carbon pollution produced by burning fossil fuels, a measure pushed by some Republicans as a conservative climate solution based on free market principles. Mr. Woods, Exxon's chief executive, has also argued that instead of an inefficient patchwork of regulations in the United States, the federal government should instead simply tax carbon. Mr. McCoy seemed to contradict that position. Nobody is going to propose a tax on all Americans. And the cynical side of me says, yeah, we know that, he says, but it gives us a talking point. Alex Flint, executive director for Alliance for Market Solutions, which has led the push for a carbon tax, said his experience with Exxon's lobbyists was that they are, quote, genuinely committed to a carbon tax and realize that a lot of work needs to be done. <laughs> so... I think the interesting aspect to hear is that uh, one, like you know, their their efforts are focused on a number of Democratic senators that don't just include Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, but also that the um, sort of bipartisan infrastructure plan, which will you know focus on roads and bridges by to the you know uh, to the detriment of doing anything about climate change, and that also the sort of compromise solution of a carbon tax on on uh, fossil fuels is one that the people proposing know will never happen. So keep that in mind anytime anyone talks about a carbon tax or a compromise on global warming. So, like I said, nothing exactly earth-shattering here, but I, wanna, I just wanted to read just a little of that article to frame um, what I'm going to talk about for uh, the, 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 the main part of the show, which is um, a new piece in New York Magazine by uh, Rebecca Traster about, uh, just going to headline here, Biden's Big Left Gamble. The president is overseeing a sea change in the world of economic policy, and so much hangs in the balance. So, I mean, I, 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 I think we all know how we feel about Rebecca Traister, <clears throat> but I, I just think like the, uh, th this is part and parcel of the effort we've talked about for to uh, portray the new Biden, the Biden administration as being a sort of transformative in its its ambition and the scope of their agenda like on the scale of like fdr or lbj and like, this kind of bemused take about oh like joe biden's the last guy we'd ever thought would would govern like this but you know here's how it happened so i think it's important to um understand what's going on in these pieces and certainly understand them in the context of that first new york times article that i've just talked about like which is you know D despite how you know the fact that they're seeming to make noise about you know uh, direct spending or d infrastructure or sort of a, a Keynesian economic outlook, uh, the party itself is still entirely captured by you know fossil fuel lobbyists and the people of that nature. So, any like I said, like it, the the grand ambitions in this infrastructure plan have already been scaled back at the request of these fossil fuel executives, and they're doing it through Democratic senators, like I said, which are include Chris Coons, uh, Mark Warner. Uh, you you know the list of people here. So let's just like I think this is like a like a, a, a there's a very long piece, and it's Rebecca Traister's attempt to sort of chart out you know how this bold new Biden agenda came to be, and let's let's see what we make of this. In December 2016. Progressive economist Heather Boucher, who had recently advised Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, was trying to cheer me up. Sure, America had just elected Donald Trump, whose economic team consisted of six white guys named Steve. Boucher told me then, but the good news was that Clinton's economic team, which included several women and only three gut white guys named Mike, had been planning infrastructure legislation that was half traditional bridge and road stuff and half unprecedented support for America's wobbly child, elder, home, and community care system systems through a mandated paid leave policy, caps on child care costs, and increased wages for caregivers, long elusive feminist priorities. Even in the wake of a devastating loss, Boucher was confident that enormous shifts were taking place, ones that had been underway for some time. The Democratic Party, even its establishment leaders like Clinton, had begun to move away from the centrist, Wall Street-driven approach that had characterized it for the past 50 years towards a greater commitment to big public investment, the kind that came out of nowhere for gender and racial equality. Those mics all understand the care economy, Boucher joked, and, then, and someday there is going to be another Democratic administration. So... Uh, you know, an, an advisor to Hillary Clinton, you know, reassuring Rebecca Traister on election night that, you know, had, had they been elected, the good guys would have been in charge. And then eventually there will be a new Democratic administration and all of the groundwork has been laid for this this new sea change in uh, long sought after progressive uh, policies. That's uh, that, that's interesting. Who's coming? Who's coming after Biden? It's an interesting question. I mean, there are noises. Dude, yeah, dude, <laughs> do, do you think it's Kamala? Is no. that what she thinks? <laughs> Is that what she fucking thinks? 
Nobody That's, thinks that. Even Democrats. No, yeah. They're like, well, God, this lady is not going to win. And they're fine with that. Kamala is the only person who thinks it's going to be Kamala next. It's incredible. You know, I love I love uh, like dirty old Joe. Just so like mentally deficient, wandering around ice cream parlors. Anytime anyone asks him a question, he's like, come on, man, it's Harbor Day. <laughs> but he, he knows enough. To be like, hey, Kamala, it's your job to go to the border. <laughs> it's your job to take over this incredibly like divisive, explosive issue. Doing that we have your, no solution you, for. We have no just solution tried to for. Snow you into thinking that we're doing anything about this like reality of the current American economy that we have this spigot of people coming in, people whose countries we fucked up in one way or the other. They are fulfilling this need that all our companies have for like illegally cheap labor like paying people well below what they should be paid we realize we have to have it because this thing has to keep going but we can't have too much we can't have too much because people get mad and we already like don't have the safety net for anyone so you have to go there and say just send us the right amount of people (laughs) and you're gonna do that kamala with your trademark ability to always say the right thing (laughs) to always come off you know, in a way, no one, you know, Kamala goes in a room, she leaves. No one ever goes, what the fuck was that woman talking about? What kind of person even is that? What's what the, what the fuck's up with her? No one ever says that. No yeah, Everyone always thought, thinks, wow, Kamala, that certainly is an appropriate time to just burst into laughter. Yeah, no one's ever, no one's, <laughs> Kamala's, no one's ever met Kamala and been like, that's the weirdest fucking woman I've ever met in my entire life. That's never happened. So, you know, props to Joe. Still has one trick in the book. This one. Yeah, he. Yeah, he, he gave her uh, the border and voting rights. I'm mean, like that should tell you everything about how much they actually care about achieving any kind of corrective to yeah. the massive voter suppression laws that are going on. Nothing's getting done. But <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, did, I did see like the, you know because uh, pieces are starting to get planted in the press, and you know um, we've all been alluding to it about like how like. You know, top Democrats um, are are saying that like you know Kamala ain't it, and that like she would lose to any Republican or even Trump himself should he run again, uh, if if she if she gets put out there. Um, and then of course like the her her defenders like I've seen this this sort of spate of reactions to these articles, uh, being like oh wow um I, I, I what what's changed that all of a sudden that like a vice president is getting all of this criticism and anger directed at them and I'm like. <laughs> I mean, like, Dick Cheney was vice president for eight years, and then, like, you don't have to go back that far to find, like, you know, Dan Quayle or Spiro Agnew. It's just, like, being VP is, like, you're always... Uh, it's, like, either you can be a VP that nobody talks about, or you can be a VP that, like, takes all the abuse for the uh, administration that you're, you're in. Then that's what Kamala's doing. She's taking all the abuse that should be meant for Joe and everyone else, and... I would feel bad for her, but it's like, hey, you got what you wanted, didn't you? I mean, it's not going to do anything for her. Joe is at, like, Joe, he's at the numbers of one of those, like, Kyrgyzstan dictators who puts up, like, a giant bronze statue of himself that rotates all around the country. <laughs> a giant bronze statue Joe's of like, major. Yeah, Joe's at, like, 74%. He's at something crazy, and he's he's like that because, like, most of the people that voted for him, everything that's supposed to turn you off about Joe Biden most of the people who voted for him are like, I do that. Yeah. That's cool to do. I smell hair. I like forget <laughs> who people's names are. And I, I like, I just hang out in ice cream parlors all the time. It's all. Yeah. I that, do. Like the ice cream thing is perfect. Cause like every time I see the, them do another photo op of him deep throating a fucking ice cream cone, I just think this makes him look senile. But for the nation's vast number of senile voters, they're like, ah, I could go for some ice cream. Yeah. No, it's exactly like, you know, we like talking about George H.W. Bush because he was such a good bridge because he was the last guy, really, where Americans are like, no, I want someone who's better than me. Like, that's what they thought about him. I want a cold patrician, like a guy who openly says something as cold as I will never apologize for my country, right or wrong. Speaking after of what, shooting speaking down of an Iranian, down. <laughs> yeah, an Iranian passenger jet. Then, you know, with Clinton, people wanted someone who was like that, who they thought was like them. You know, with George W. Bush, you go, oh, he's he's stupid like my dad. <laughs> Vote for him. And with Biden, Biden's the highest end of that. Um, he he really reflects us more than Trump, far more. But uh, 
it is amazing. Like the amount of uh, manpower put into convincing you you're seeing more than you're actually seeing. It's amazing. This Tracer article, what is this, the 50th article like this? Yep. What the fuck is this? Rebecca, you were late to the party. They were writing these back in March. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. You're usually ahead of the curve. What's what's up? You're not on the email list anymore? What's up? Well, as as the as that early giddy rush goes away and they all realize that, oh, all this really ended up being because everyone was sort of getting ahead of themselves and just imagining all the amazing stuff that Biden was going to do because of some leaked story about him getting full of horseradish at a staff meeting and going, yeah, let's do the new deal again. <laughs> um, but now they're, it's a little later and, and the wheels are grinding much more slowly and, and the Senate is doing its agonizing work and they're looking around to like, oh, all we actually got out of this is a fucking, uh, is a helicopter drop of money that t- Trump would have done too and would have done earlier. Uh, and nothing else. So now we have to get, we're going to get another round to reaffirm this narrative that's already falling apart. Yeah. Because no, they have nothing else. I don't think it's because Tracer has been left off the email list. I just think like Tracer is at a, at a higher level. So she's got to come up with some real, some meat here. So she's doing this in July 2021. Okay. Uh, it's like she can, she can stretch that vial a little bit longer. And like, you know, a lot of this is based on, like, let's, let's go to some of the names of people. Tracer, Tracer is like, I guess, you know, other people like Koss and all those people, they're like, you know, they're low levels. They're, they're not even butt men. Tracer is like Al Neary. You really st- <laughs> you stick her in there when you need a special job. I guess I guess wrong. What does she say here? All right. Well, I'm just going to like just go into some details here. Uh, it says, but she wasn't just going to wait around. Boucher and Pyle, one of the mics, began hosting dinners for economists, lawyers and policy nerds who believe things needed to change. The dinners were held in restaurants in New York and San Francisco. So uh, already things are definitely going to really change when you're uh, yeah. gathering uh, lobbyists and policy nerds at fancy restaurants in New York and San Francisco. You're going to just gonna walk with yeah. <laughs> your ideas yeah. that are really outside of the box. Just walking by just seas of just openly dying homeless people, <laughs> the people who put them there going to eat sea foam for $138. <laughs> we're going to fix this. So this is your... Uh, Boucher hosted a couple at her house in D.C. and cooked for the crew. Among those invited were Rohit Chopra, who had helped Elizabeth Warren set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Wally Ademo, who had worked at the CFPB, Steph Feldman, a policy aide to Joe Biden, Angela Hanks, then at the Groundwork Collaborative, the Groundwork Collaborative, and Jennifer, Har- <laughs> and Jennifer Harris of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Um, bah- uh, b- Bharat... Uh, Rama Murthy, an advisor to Warren, and an antitrust specialist, Lisa Khan, were also informally involved. So just, just like r- running down the list here, that's three out of six people who are all from Elizabeth Warren's orbit. And then like so, this is this is what yeah. Tracer is really up to. Because I mean, like you'll remember, like she was a a true Warren partisan throughout, you know, two election cycles. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming Boucher like got all these winners around and was like What's a policy that has the word do in it? <laughs> Sounds like what she did. Um, yeah, no, this is... What's I, a piece I, of I, legislation I, that never gets old? I, I, I felt the inkling of some Warren bullshit when she was talking about, like, uh, you know, there's an economist who's, like, a little outside of Biden world, but with one toe in. It's like, who would that be? And, like, you know, I had forgotten myself. I haven't, like, followed Tracer that much since 2016. I remember this hilarious thing. Uh, it was in 2017. It was like after like Weinstein, like the Hollywood cabal was like, all right, we're going to give you Weinstein. And Rebecca Tracer had this thing that was like, Harvey Weinstein was mean to me once like 15 years ago. And then people were like, ooh, yeah, don't be mean to Rebecca Tracer. And it's like, yeah, that's why he went down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why she wrote an article about him like three it, months uh, after all the shit broke. Yeah, she could have shared I, it when I, it mattered. <laughs> but like, uh, I did. But yeah, I am so like out of the loop with her. I thought like eh, she didn't support Biden. I know that. Who she like Julian Castro? Something stupid like that. But no, it's of course Warren. It's someone from Warren World. This is. This, I mean, like, yeah. This is like this is going to be the. This is what's going to be the. We're going to form the bones 
of this new, uh, you know, the new New Deal, like this this new grand ambitious shift in democratic politics, is of course everyone who's been, who's been working for and voting for Elizabeth Warren. I mean, we know first step, first step, <laughs> barber shops everywhere. Everywhere is going to be converted into a barber shop. <laughs> they're going to be de- DVDs for every barber shop. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have Spider Man Three Blu Ray in a frame. <laughs> no mirrors though. You can, you can yeah. look at the backs of fucking Blu Ray discs. To, to the, check check out your fade is going. That was amazing. And by the way, you know, fair is fair. The Bernie people fucking hired the barbershop guy. <laughs> Why? Why? What did you see? What, what? did you see? You, I need this. We need this. It was the this Peter guy, Rabbit this guy. DVD tacked to the wall in my mind <laughs> that yeah. made it perfect. And that made those guys geniuses who needed to be supported in all their endeavors. If they had to hired the nude barber, they would have done way better than this fucking guy. Oh my god, the nude barber! The nude barber would have done. I don't oh think they god. could have got him, honestly. Yeah. No, yeah, he's, he's too he's, high he's, up. There. He's all about his paper. He doesn't give a shit about politics. Yeah, the I'm nude just, barber, you nude, you'd have to give him a special tax guarantee, like eighty dollars haircuts. The only he has a local monopoly. The only nude cut in Chicago. He's got to be making eighty million dollars a year. I'm just imagining uh, like politicians having to go to the nude barber shop for like like photo like fucking media hits or whatever like fucking like uh, Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders getting the he's like you know uh, he's like you know you can touch my dick if you want yeah. Yeah. I can feel your thing on my 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 shoulder just kidding man <laughs> so it goes, uh, just, continuing you, that's the- like I feel like you could put Biden in the nude barber shop and he wouldn't like. He's the only guy who would be like, "What the fuck is right. this?" He'd be like, right. "Oh yeah, this makes sense that I'm here." <laughs> he would he would start remembering things about how uh, w- there used to be nude barber shops when I was growing up. What happened to him? This guy's keeping it alive. There were some guys. There were some guys. They went to Korea. They're Marines, real sturdy guys, about as wide as they were tall. And you don't see him like that anymore. You see, you know, you put the milk on the doorstep, it's getting drunk. <laughs> but the only way they could deal with what they had seen in South Korea was that they had to get naked to cut people's hair. You're right. Biden is the only one who could do a nude barbershop media hit and not have it be a complete disaster. No, he would be totally cool with it. He'd be <laughs> smooth sailing. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, a great time at the nude barber. Okay. Uh, continuing in the article. A um, few of the people, a uh, few of the people meeting in these groups were outsiders. Exactly, some had already advised presidents, but many had been traumatized by the slow pace of economic recovery after the 2008 financial crisis and the decision to bail out banks while millions of Americans lost homes and jobs. Some were reckoning with their own roles in that recovery and the politics that undergirded it. Jake Sullivan, formerly Clinton's top policy advisor, wrote a 2018 piece in Democracy Journal arguing that Democrats had reached another turning point at which the recession had laid bare the failure of our government to protect its citizens. Others were coming to the conversations out of movements for economic, racial, and gender justice. Uh, The approach they were taking, those looking to push the establishment from inside and those wondering how to make a new establishment, functioned like the professional class's version of a grassroots organizing. Unlike, just skipping ahead here, uh, unlike the young progressive politicians who have infiltrated the Democratic Party via primaries, these economists... Infiltrated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's how I'd put that. <laughs> they infiltrated it by running as a Democrat and having people vote for them in a primary. Yeah. <laughs> Doing everything a Democrat would do. What a sneaky disguise. Uh, These economists are working to make change at the behest of the party's establishment. The president's hiring at many levels of of his administration has been unexpected and diverse, and not just in a Gina Haspel girl torturer way. He has injected new ideological blood, much of it from the lineage of his primary opponent, Warren, who has long believed that personnel is policy. Biden brought in these wonks to implement his economic agenda. So, He's bringing in this uh, a diverse crew of wonks all from Elizabeth Warren's orbit. And this is like this is the new thinking. This is the new policy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's new for the Democratic Party because if it's coming from Elizabeth Warren, it's just what Republicans believe 30 years ago. Yeah. Do you think like Joe like asked for wonks on purpose? <laughs> like, what do, you, do you think like he probably said, like, give me, give me some wonks. What was he actually asking for? We may never know. 
<laughs> it was a racial slur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get me some wops. I got, you know, I saw some walks on the Dumont Network last night. Boy, those guys could sure dance. <laughs> it is often said that Trump was saying the quiet part loud about his party's animating hatreds and eagerness to break democratic systems and about its willingness to run up enormous deficits on behalf of giant tax cuts for corporate America. Among other things, his bravado helped to put the Democrats' comparative timidity into stark relief. Now we're saying the quiet part loud, said Wong. For example, that more antitrust regulation is good for America. Politicians couldn't imagine even five years ago saying that out loud. The Trump he president- said that during Bush. <laughs> he said that during Clinton. Are you fucking high? Did, did, did this fucking dummy actually believes this shit. I can tell. I can tell. The Trump comparison is so instructive, though, because it's like he said all this shit and governed exactly like Marco Rubio. That's what they're actually doing here. They're going to they're gonna all get senators to quote tweet each other going, antitrust is good, and then just do this. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, that's what they learned from Trump. It's like, oh, if you just holler uh, at the top of your lungs some shit that your base thinks they want, then you could do whatever you want and they won't even notice. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like now we're saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, we're, we're not we're not governing any differently, but we're certainly speaking louder. Yeah, it, but it's also like this is the same like bullshit I would see when like Tom Daschle was majority leader. It, it's like. Uh, the more competition is good for America. We need antitrust. Like, I've seen this. I've seen as a union membership gets decimated. Unions are good for America because it's patriotic to like your boss, but also have respect. Unions, ju- unions are just getting fucking decapitated all over the country. Uh, it's we shall have a living wage. You know, <laughs> wages don't go up. How too many, many, many humans are perishing. Thirty fucking of COVID. years. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck off with this. Uh, In some ways, the Biden administration is edging towards something Democrats have been scared to do since the rise of Ronald Reagan, showcasing government as a salubrious force in regular people's lives. Reagan built his regime on racist, sexist tropes about welfare queens sucking federal dollars from a white middle class and told Americans that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. For decades, Democrats ceded to those characterizations. Biden, in contrast, regularly fr- regularly frames the federal government as the force that stemmed math death, mass death and permitted economic survival through the pandemic. Shots in arms, checks in bank accounts. He publicly centers equity that government investment in housing, jobs, climate initiatives and care work is good because it addresses racial and gender injustice and gives speeches about employers needing to compete for workers by raising, raising wages. Despite an unwilling Senate, he speaks with conviction about raising taxes on the wealthy rather than bailing out banks. For the first time since 1993, Biden's 2022 budget proposal did not include the discriminatory Hyde Amendment, which prohibits the use of federal insurance money to pay for uh, pay for abortions. There is, of course, a chasm between Biden's words, which are important, and legislative reality. Hyde will almost certainly wind up in the final budget. Billions get slashed from infrastructure every time two senators brush against each other in a hallway. So, you know, uh, but uh, the chasm remains there. But but the words, they're good. And that's yeah. what matters, really. I mean, if, if you're not really if, if you're Rebecca Tracer and people who read Rebecca Tracer, words are all that matters because it doesn't really it's not going to affect yeah. you. Like that was so funny when they said the people coming together for this thing for this witch's covenant or like like were traumatized by the response uh, to the the economic crisis. In what sense? Like in an aesthetic <laughs> yeah, way? Yeah, like you watch yeah. a movie and there's a, a violence in it that you're fucking traumatized by the way everybody is nowadays. That's about it. That's the extent of your trauma. Your actual life, your bank account just keeps getting bigger. Your fucking four hundred one k just keeps going up. I mean, like uh, the trauma. Yeah, th- that line stuck out to me as well, Matt, because like the trauma that they're referring to is like the trauma of maybe feeling some sense of like sheepish embarrassment over helping to author the policies that led to the 2008 crash. But they're oh, saying like, they're, they're, oh, they're, darn they're, it. They're, they're sharing they're sharing these recollections at fucking fancy dinners in New York and San Francisco. So it's like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, they've been real. They've been really fucking traumatized by the economic crash. Not like they're fucking got evicted from their house or anything. What's. What's one policy you made that got people addicted to fentanyl? 
<laughs> what's, yeah, once again, what, what, that, that's a good Eric Albert question because if, if you come out of like the Clinton, so world, the answer is it's open fucking ended. You can just say almost any one of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is amazing. Like I love that this really is not meant to be read by anyone, but like people who are already like totally on board because it's like anyone else reads that these economists who like worked for the Clintons and shit going to like a restaurant called like Sandal Beach in fucking San Francisco, walking by a guy just fucking bleeding out of his mouth, just tense everywhere, and going, it was really hard watching the news the last 30 years <laughs> and, what, and what I did. Anyone else reads that, you start, like, you start Googling, like, gun show loophole. <laughs> but if you're already on board, you're like, damn, what, what, a, what a bunch of guys and gals. Well, they're working hope, to make things hope right. They, hope, um, they, hope they're keeping. Uh, hope they're having more dinners. Skipping ahead, uh, Tracer writes: one of Biden's most salient qualities, perhaps what uh, Francis Fox Piven meant when she referred to his quote sleazy politician vibe, and others describe as his undeniable aptitude for retail politics, gives him another advantage. Joe Biden is good at being a politician. When ideological shifts are precipitous, said Claudia Sam, an econo ec economist who served on the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, some people get very torn because they're not fighting just an older generation, they're fighting their past selves. But if you're political enough, you just roll with it and pretend no one noticed. I don't get a lot of sense that from Biden that he's feeling bad, and he shouldn't feel bad. Over the years, he has changed his mind on gay marriage and abortion, acknowledged that the drug laws he wrote wreaked havoc on families. We actually do want politicians to be responsive, at least to our side, said Dorian Warren. Politicians are supposed to constantly put their finger to the air to see which way the wind, blow, wind is blowing. It's our job to shift the wind. I mean, again here, it's like this acknowledging trauma thing. You know, it's like, well, Biden feels bad about those millions of people he put behind bars in the fucking 80s and 90s. And, Not doing know, anything about it, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. he has acknowledged it. So I can feel better about voting for him and defending him online all day. That really is like when people are like, Biden's really surprised me. What they mean is like, oh, he's totally alleviated any social awkwardness I have from like the <laughs> yep. five, year, five <laughs> years of like, oh, uh, no, nah, honey, I'm done with old white men, despite like, you know, going to Vassar and being a descendant of like both the Warburgers and uh, Otto von Bismarck. Uh, five years of just being like, um, talking about like ableism or whatever and then like biden gets in there it, he 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 saw what you went through the weird the gulf between what you said and what you were doing and he's like don't worry i'm gonna like i'll, I'll do that thing where i say the same thing in a tweet 20 times or well, i'll get someone who works for me to do it i mean there's like another telling line about how like uh like politicians shouldn't have to fight their old selves or feel bad about it you know, because it's like that's a that's amazing. Because yeah, it's just like, no. well, okay, like we're 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 empowering these people to fix the problems that they caused, that they directly caused, and then they're like, oh well, in order to do that, they shouldn't feel bad about causing them in the first place. Joe Biden is like the Forrest Gump of everything that went wrong for the past forty years. Not went wrong was purposely done wrong. He's smiling at the side of every picture, and he wasn't necessarily the architect of all of these, but he was definitely there. The ones he wasn't, he was still there making sure he got his fingerprints in, into the concrete so he could get, like, a windbreaker and a handshake out of the deal. <laughs> like, this is, not just, this is not just, like, a bystander to history. He's been everywhere. One of the ways the wind has changed in recent years is that it's not always blowing from the top. <laughs> Amazing Joe Biden's sentence. not always getting top anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting I crashed the, I got, I crashed the I crashed the wraith. The road top is too sloppy. We all make mistakes. Uh, Joe Biden is the president because of organizing that originated not with his party, but with voters and activists long ignored by Democrats. He seems to have learned from that. To see that black women and indigenous people and poor people and Latinos and Asians delivered states that he never thought he could win, said Jayapal, he has turned out to be somebody who learned things that probably would contradict things he did in the past. I think it's literally impossible for him to learn things. Yeah. He can, at this point, <laughs> he's too busy uh, having having perfect uh, like uh, mimetic recall of of his of like the taste of a root beer float and a, and the sensation of a hand job in a 57 Bonneville that he had when he was a kid to have any new information absorb into his brain.
Yeah, sorry. I would love to learn the word Latinx, but I'm remembering the exact contours and depth of my mom's birth canal and the smell of the doctor's <laughs> secondhand cigarette smoke as I was being born. Ah, Chesterfields. <laughs> yeah. They always said those were the healthiest to get secondhand smoke from. Jumping ahead a little bit, this is a very long piece. I'm just going to see if I can sprint to the end here. In winning the White House in this moment, Biden signed up for a big job, and it remains unclear whether he's up to it. <laughs> can he capably... <laughs> okay, that's right. really that's a little one way to put it. I mean, you could say the same thing about him, like making a pot of coffee, <laughs> going for a walk alone. <laughs> Can he capably a shower? Can he capably oversee a transition into a new era of progressive economic policy, one that many in his administration had been, have been working toward for more than a decade? Or maybe the pressure to make Biden the Reagan of the left is misplaced. As Dorian Warren hypothesized to me, if we are indeed in the midst of a crumbling of the, of the crumbling of the old neoliberal conservative order, it's possible that the stage we're in now is an interregnum of some kind. <laughs> yeah, an interregnum <laughs> between a Democratic president and a Republican one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sam posits that the only way forward is the natural ascension of the next generation. This has to go in stages, she said. You have, you have to have people like Heather and Jared who can get close enough to the establishment to be that transition. Then you have to have people like Lisa Kahn. Generational transitions take time. Some days I'm like, burn it all down. But in general, progress is slow and painful. That's her talking to her <laughs> landscapers. <laughs> The fuck are you talking about? Burn it all down. You're it. <laughs> uh, Burn it all down. Where would you go to work? This is all you've ever fucking done. What are you talking about? You fucking dumbass. Oh my god. I think like it's like with these. These are so th like these people really think they think that it's amazing. Yeah, because oh, yeah. they only talk to each other. And they all. Yeah. They all are, they all have a vested interest in maintaining this delusion, and so they just spit it into each other's face all day long. All right, finishing it out here, it says, we do not have time. One senior member of the administration describes what keeps them up at night. This is an economic policy strategy that hasn't been undertaken in 40 years, being undertaken in a moment that is so unprecedented. Getting that transition right, they said, is so important. Letting it, letting it breathe, so important. The way we handle ourselves in this situation... So important. Uh -huh. getting, it, getting, yeah. getting progressive mm -hmm. economic policy right is so important. And there is so much, from Senate obstruction to supply chain blockages to the logistical challenges of implementing new ideas that could go wrong. Screw-ups would harm millions of Americans, the planet, and Joe Biden's legacy. <laughs> God forbid, God forbid if millions of Americans and the planet get harmed in the process, uh, Joe Biden's legacy could also get dinged. But you know could, what is the most fucked up thing? I feel like it wouldn't. No, it'd be fine. <laughs> like, it'd be would, fine. Yeah, no. He'd be fine. His legacy is assured. He defeated Donald Trump. That's it. That's yeah. all he needed to do. He will be he will be remembered positively by like most Americans just for that simple fact alone. Oh yeah. I mean, it be, especially because it's like think about the Democratic bench after him. Like who the fuck did they, they have like Eric Swalwell? Are you fucking kidding me? Cory Booker is not walking through yeah. that door. <laughs> no, no. Cory Booker won't be having his much fantasized about White House wedding. <laughs> it goes, uh, and Joe Biden's legacy. But they could also halt a crucial and overdue turn of the Democratic Party away from its compromised past. <laughs> away from it. It's not a compromised past. It's its past. That's the Democratic Party. They didn't compromise shit. It was one of those compromises where I did everything I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're they are having their pie and eating it too like megan mccardle uh it says here uh away from its compromised past and towards a more humane future this is an extraordinary moment the official said it couldn't be higher stakes but if something goes wrong we're going to discredit everything that many of us have been working towards i like like in, in that last in the last statement of that that quote and the piece it's just sort of like it's it's an assurance for for the people reading this who may be asking themselves like why aren't I seeing any more of this progressive economic policy and this sea change away from a neoliberal democratic party to a more humane one? Well, the answer is they're working on getting it exactly right because if they fuck and, it up, yeah. I mean then, then things could really go wrong for this country. Imagine that. And and that the last part of it is so great because it's like it's baked in either way. Like, if it does happen and it's not far and as far as you'd like it to be, it's like, oh, well, we have to get it exactly right. 
if there is like not another Democratic president for another like 12 years, it's like, oh, well, we accidentally discredited it because, you know, like people fucked up. You know, it's like it's like defund the police. It's like, yeah, you have like an admittedly like unpopular slogan, but you are able to like go back in time and paint every like Democratic Party fuck up with this. Right. And so it just it just becomes this truism that any time a Democrat like fails, it's because of defund the police. So for now, for what for the now that we're done with that one, we 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 can have uh you know, we we were we were walking on a tightrope, we were keeping all these plates in the air, they fell down, not exactly our fault. Um next time we'll go even slower. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. That was a Rebecca Traster on on Joe Biden's big gamble on the left. <laughs> let's see. Let's see if yeah, it pays huge off. Huge gamble. Let's see if it Massive. pays off. You know, I mean, it's high risk, high reward, baby. The best type of gamble, the one where you don't lose anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being the house rules. <laughs> yeah. What is it? They always win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the the win casino really needs. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming to terms with the compromises they made with their guests in the past. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, Mo- the Mohegan Sun's big bet on blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, okay. To uh, all right. So let, let's close out the show by talking about women that's right Finally. that's right fellas let's not talk about let's talk about the ladies let's talk about respecting females and let's talk about uh respecting females from the uh perspective of the federalist.com that's right the federalist uh it's been slim pickings at the federalist for a while now but you know they're 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 all they're occasionally always worth a glance in on what's going over it there at what, what i regard as by far the horniest conservative news opinion site by far i mean and and i think i think this 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 article here is a good uh indication of that this is uh courtesy of the federalist this is meet the flyover women pop culture ignores the flyover hmm. woman understands her womanhood and motherhood deep in her bones and doesn't see maleness as a goal to achieve or person to conquer this is by carrie gress and I just want to read here the bio. Carrie Gress is a fellow at Ethics and Public Policy Center. A mother of five, she has a doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America and is the author of several books, including The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing Culture from Toxic Femininity, and Theology at Home. She is the editor of the online, online women's magazine, theologyofhome.com. I love the book The Anti-Mary. I mean, these Catholics, are, they've come up with a new Antichrist, and it's the anti-Mary. It's every fake, every fake bitch out there. <laughs> yeah. And I do, I mean, I would like to see what the article has to say, but I would like to counter with the, the subheadline. I would say about 60% of culture is for these women. Well, yeah. Have you watched the NBC <laughs> nightly lineup? It's a very specific, I mean, she's not, I mean, like the, the, the use of the term flyover woman is doing a lot of work to make it seem like the vast majority of American women are Catholic, you know, theology at home bloggers. So, okay. All right. So this is Carrie Gress uh, writing in The Federalist. Adherents of radical feminism are five decades into a powerful campaign that seeks to shape the way American women think. Politics, fashion, Hollywood, academia, and media propagate a singular vision of womanhood, relying on savvy use of optics, messaging, and even makeup. These radical feminists have done a remarkable job of silencing or sidelining their critics. Now, uh, just like like opening salvo here, it's one of my favorite favorite moves in uh, like sort of conservative uh, culture war agita or polemic is that they uh, you know they, they they start out with a uh, the, a statement is something that's that's generically true that you know uh f- feminism and and it's it's sort of uh it's it's morals and codes of behavior have ha- has over the last 5 decades grown to dominate you know things like uh the entertainment industry and fashion in superficial ways and then she's saying like the, but they they're they're they they've created only one model of womanhood and they they punish any deviation from this that's my job that like that's my favorite thing about these type of play, is like they're they're just angry that there's competition in the um, there's only one way to be a woman um, lane of uh, discourse. 
Ironically, whether they know it or not, feminists' unspoken premise insists men are superior to women and women must become like them in pursuit of equality. Therefore, to be equal, women must be able to eliminate the consequences of sex, like men, and rid themselves of unborn children through unrestricted abortion. Abortion is the crux of most women's policy issues and is at the heart of the greatest political divisions in the United States. What we will never see in the splashy pages of Vanity Fair, for instance, are the many happy women who buck the feminist narrative, loving, nurturing, consoling, clothing, cleaning, and adoring their numerous children without trying to live like men. From Maine to Hawaii, these are the women who have opened themselves up to the dramatic and self-sacrificial love required when one person truly loves another. They carry children in their wombs, their arms, their hearts, their minds. They know the preciousness of a tender embrace from small arms, a little face leaning to offer kisses, the peppering of questions from a curious child, and the dig deep challenges of teenagers, sometimes all in the same hour. Some know the struggle of children with broken bodies or broken minds or both, and some know that the gaping hole that will never be filled when a child or children are lost. But among them all, there isn't a single regret in bringing another soul into the world. I mean, I know this is talking about like, you know, like the, the women you won't read about in the pages of Vanity Fair, but I mean, like having a kid is still a pretty common experience. Yeah. No, it's one of the most popular activities to do. <laughs> I mean, the, the, this, the, the sense of oppression that this person feels is that they are, they are one of the women that they don't like in that they are in that, in that bubble of where, where, uh, where career women go and where these questions are always being debated so fraughtly. Uh, and so there just is this, this yearning to, to imagine some other woman who's living a life uh, that isn't just overcome with all of these, these questions and, and that isn't uh, overawed by uh, the necessity of, of engaging in, in uh you know, uh, employment and, and making the trade-offs of being a career person. And it just boils down to uh, wanting to do it. But really, I mean, if you really wanted to do it, you could. And if you didn't want to feel oppressed by the culture, you really could not uh, engage with it. I mean, th the thing is, is that what's really compelling people to do things that they don't really want to do either way, whether it's raise a family that, that they're not ready for or forego raising a family that they would like to is, is the coerciveness of the market. That's what's, the, that's what's actually uh, the oppressing force here. Uh, but that's the thing that nobody at the Federalist has the ability or desire to point out, so they just have to continually uh, rail against this culture that they think is oppressing them uh, because it's the only thing that they can uh, address. Yeah, like is is the American economy ready to lose half the workforce to like uphold so that the women like Carrie can be in Vanity Fair? I don't think so. Well, it's a, you couldn't if you if, yeah even, even if, if you was, wanted to even if there even if it wasn't an issue of like needing workers, people need to fucking make money. The 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 the, uh, the nuclear family with with a uh, division of labor between domestic and and outside. One of them un, uh, compensated by the market, the other uncompensated. Uh, what it was a historical artifact that has been destroyed uh, by neoliberalism, and and it is no longer viable for for huge numbers of people, and that is the context where all of this culture war bullshit about femininity and child rearing is happening in, and it's the actual determining factor. But the the reason that things like the Federalist exist is so that we could talk about something other than that. I, I think like the, the Federalist whole thing is that like they, they just want to be in Vanity Fair. Like like that's it. Like, yeah, that, exactly. That's, that's, that's the thing. They, like, they, they want it's like with Trump. It's like Trump doesn't hate the Hollywood sickos. Trump doesn't hate the mainstream media, really. He he hates them only because that they won't accept him and embrace him. And it's the same thing. They want a culture where they dominate. That's it. They want to be affirmed. They 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 don't actually give a shit about the living these values. They just want to be validated by the culture because we're all fucking narcissists and we need it to reflect ourselves or else we're not real and our and our and our lives aren't real. Uh, when uh, Carrie continues, uh, while the Huffington Post just announced that child free women are having a bit of a moment in the media, one wonders what they think the last 50 years have been. 
Flyover women are the moms and daughters and wives and sisters and friends the media overlooks because they are religious or frumpy or don't have sexy day jobs. They are considered uneducated doormats. Their bodies are often tired, hair not always perfectly coiffed, and nails rarely, manu rarely manicured. Their homes may not be camera ready, their meals probably aren't gourmet, and talking points aren't ready on their tongues. But mostly, the issue is that they don't believe in abortion and they do believe in the sanctity of marriage. <laughs> I love I love how much she runs these women down. Yeah, it's like, like they look it's like, like shit. I thought, uh, they smell they like look shit. Like shit. <laughs> they can't even their one job of like making the home nice and cooking good meals that they give themselves. They're not even good at it. Their yeah, that's sucks. how you can tell that this is this is from such a distance. This is so contemptuous and and uh, and condescending. Is is that she's just imagining these smelly hill people? These simple. <laughs> These simple uh, uh, noble savages out in the hinterlands yeah. just shooting kids <laughs> out of them, them's like they're the they're the fucking Schlitterbahn, and and, and, and just no connection to it at all. The, well, that's that's the amazing thing about it is like you know there are people like this, like sort of like sullen, religiously minded people who like pump out a bunch of kids, but it's like okay, it sort of reminds me of like when Eric Adams. Uh, when he did really well, we don't know if he won yet, fingers crossed, uh, people are like, oh, these black voters are rejecting wokeness. And it's like, no, you think of everything on a woke or unwoke continuum. Yeah. Like, the, the, the other people, like, don't. It's just, like, there may be individual things that they like or dislike, but they're not, like, because they're not media hyper consumers, they're going, oh, there's a, the, this is, like, a seven on the woke scale. This is a three. They just know that, like, okay, when Maya Wiley talks, she's, like, I don't, just doesn't work with me. I like this weird guy. I'm 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 a fucking weird New Yorker who works at uh, Forest Hills Beef Tenderloin Warehouse. That's my business. <laughs> but it's like they're, they're making decisions on their own metrics that are of importance and relevance to their own world that like you clearly don't understand. Yeah, I mean it's, it's also not, they're not they're not litigating like you're the way that you view media. Just like when you do meet like sort of like a religiously minded person who has like a bunch of fucking kids, they're not like, oh, I work so hard making my disgusting meals and raising my ugly kids, but like, why can't I be on? Why why can't my life be on Netflix? No, they never think about that. They <laughs> also, never. Uh, the the assumption here is that if you had kids, if you have had a child, by definition, you're pro, uh, you're anti-abortion. The majority of women who have abortions already have at least one child. Yep. Yeah. I mean, also, like, Matt, like you said, like, just how flagrantly she shits on these women she's supposed to be uplifting. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, uh, these frumps with cracked nails who won't turn off the flash when they fucking photograph the food gore that they're f fucking shoveling out yeah. to their awful fucking kids on Instagram. These women, yeah. the, these women may look disgusting, serve disgusting foods, their houses are dumps, their pussy feels like a <laughs> cup of water left out in a room overnight. But I like them <laughs> <laughs> because they agree with me about abortion. I assume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, these unseen and unknown women are the flyover women found in every American. Oh, city they're and unknown state. to someone here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're unknown to you. When's the last time you fuck? Where is this? Is this one of those federal federalist writers that hasn't left like Falls Church, Virginia, her entire life? Really fucking sounds like it. <laughs> he goes, uh, they've been called bigots, lectured to, condescended to, and ignored by those who consider themselves morally superior. More than anything, these women, I mean, like, this broad carry, I mean, she, she regards herself as morally superior to just about every human being on the planet. I mean, isn't that like, yeah. kind of like the whole point yeah. of being super religious? I mean, that's like what it gives you. That's like, that's the funny thing. Like, the, the woke, unwoke thing has been like, kind of a boon for conservative media because it is like a lot of the a lot of this stuff or the way of putting this stuff rather is like broadly unpopular with a lot of people but like the central thesis you know don't you hate it people telling you how to live your life and think and judging you it's like that's you dude yeah that's what i mean, <laughs> yeah, like, what I mean about all this. you've ever done <laughs> like, it's like, like it's they're, they're they're finally facing competition in the market of fucking like annoying scolds yeah. yeah, finger waggers. I love it when an, an annoying religious person is like, "Wokeness is like a religion." <laughs> like, 
It's yeah, no like, shit. Yeah, you're you, kind you're, of giving up the game it's, there. It's, your, it's the competing religion. You, you don't get to complain about that. Yeah. Get in uh, there. The, yeah. <laughs> Ford thinks Chevy is evil. <laughs> uh, These more guys just it. want to sell you cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're selling you a lifestyle. Yeah. More than anything, these women actively reject the ideology continually advanced by radical feminism. They are tired of the same Marxist effort to reimagine human nature as anything it wants to be. They reject all the latest Marxist fads propagated with clever sound bites, high-end advertising, and popular hashtags. These, <laughs> these, yeah, like uh, the 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 frumps of America's flyover country. If there's if they're doing one thing in between preparing food gore. Um, they're actively rejecting the latest Marxist fads and hashtags. Yeah, these ugly bitches hate the labor theory of value. <laughs> so it goes here, uh, flyover women. I mean, it's like, it's, it's already like an insult. <laughs> yeah, how do yeah, you call women? that? <laughs> flyover like, women. Like, yeah, you know, just, a flyover woman is a woman. You just you, you if you're you're passing by, you don't even look twice. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're. Yeah, no, just like dirty flatland barefoot. Hogs. <laughs> we call them flyovers because that's what's sw- flying over their heads are fucking uh, horse flies because they stink because yeah, they smell I, bad. There's flies over them. I love how like yeah descriptive it gets about how like frumpy and shitty they are. <laughs> just like just pure like this woman would not even like would not even look one of these people in the eye. Flyover women know feminist ideology is the weary set of ideas that led us to a country in which millions of women are desperately unhappy, and many are hard-pressed to actually define the word woman. There is no happiness in an ideology that foments narcissism, self-absorption, and isolation from the basic cell of civilization, the family. Only a deeply confused culture would seek to replace the word mother with birthing person or breastfeeding with chest feeding. The flyover woman understands her womanhood and motherhood deep in her bones and doesn't see maleness as a goal to achieve or person to conquer. She knows she needs men. She knows, as women have known for millennia, that being a woman is synonymous with carrying something. <laughs> yeah, it's called a yeah, purse. These, yeah, it's called a purse. Yeah, Ladies, these, don't go anywhere without them, all right? These, these frumpy bitches are always carrying some bread somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. Uh, women traditionally have, have been seen as a kind of vessel that transforms whatever it holds. <laughs> what? Like, is that how women have been traditionally seen? I don't know. Uh, we see it in the Romance languages where words like ocean, ship, and oven are feminine. This is why boats are named after women. That's not that. That is not true. That is not the case. I don't. I yeah. This this, anal- this analysis is running off the rails here. I don't. I don't think yeah. it's it just. Uh, but boats are named women because it's just guys are on them for months at a time, going insane from being horny. Yeah, that, I mean that's they why. fucking they they invented mermaids because they saw a fucking narwhal, and were like, dude, that's definitely a chick. I'm gonna fuck it. <laughs> Uh, uh, women are also known for their tenderness, compassion, and care for others. This isn't accidental, but part of our ability to hold others physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. When these gifts are rejected, women suffer, men suffer, children suffer, the whole of society suffers. We are living amid a tremendous social exper- societal experiment that is revealing dramatically what happens when you denigrate the most fundamental beautiful and tender bond on earth the bond between a mother and child when that is destroyed it doesn't take long for the rest of civilization to follow the same path as we now witness daily there are a lot of flyover women out there many of us feel alone overwhelmed exhausted and unseen we will continue to raise our families as best we can however imperfectly navigating the constant messaging and policies out of step with our values and beliefs because we know that without strong families What's left of civilization will collapse overnight. Maybe people should be able to have kids then. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they should not be yeah. made into fucking uh, serfs on uh, as soon as they are brought into this world. Perhaps. I just yeah. I love the shitty thinking here. Why are so many few, why are so, so so many fewer women having kids? Is it that you know ninety million American women went to Oberlin or the New School? <laughs> yes. Or is it, it that they can't afford it? You know, it's <laughs> difficult math here. <laughs> It's 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 uh, it was Sex in the City. It just looks so glamorous. <laughs> yeah, living in Manhattan. Well, there we go. Like that's, that's the, that all of that shit, all the stuff that these people get mad at needs to be understood for what it is, which is cope. Like you now, you cannot start a family. 
You have to have a job. Well, if I have to, then I should get the same wages as a man. Then I should be treated the same way in the workplace, and I should have the same goals, and I should orient. What else are you supposed to do? If that's your only opportunity for you to keep a fucking roof over your head. Well, Matt, I mean, y- you say that, but have these women considered becoming sacred vessels for the. <laughs> 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 They're saying, that's good work if you can get it. Well, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying, like, there's a lot of. <laughs> I just love the concept of the anti Mary. I think I'm going to, like, look further into this woman's book because I need to know about, like, there's the anti Christ, but, like, you know, th- th- there's, there's an anti female out there as well. It's the, the anti Mary. There's Marys out there and anti Marys, and the anti Marys have got to go. She's a disgusting sexual aunt. <laughs> <laughs> if Mary's the holy mother, there's an unholy aunt. <laughs> <laughs> A new, 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 a new meaning for the term agony aunt. <laughs> well, there we go. I think that uh, does it for today's show, gentlemen.